Okay, go ahead and go to the next slide. And I'll I'll try my best to keep on time here. Okay, those are my disclosures so you can see. Uh, next slide. Uh, so, you know, my favorite system is the energy balance system, and um, it just it 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 just fries me the way that um, many very smart people don't understand this, and everybody uh, says obesity. Well, it must be food intake. If you know the the news of the day, Kevin Hall's new study showing ultra processed food leads to increased energy intake. It's a good study. I have no problem with the study, but I can design probably ten diets that can increase food intake. Uh, and food intake is clearly important. But I think we've got to um, look at the other components. Energy expenditure is hugely influenced by fiscal activity. Again, I read in the media, fiscal activity has no role in weight loss, and it's always a nutritionist that says that. They never talk to the actual people who know it. But what I want to talk about is something a little bit different, and that's metabolic regulation. This is human physiology that really has to be taken into account when we look at energy balance. And in, the, keep going, next slide. Uh, yeah, so, so this system is so intertwined and what everybody wants to do is make it simple and say, well, food intake must be driving the system uh, to increase weight. And again, food intake is a critical part of this, but we've got to assess some other aspects. And one of the important ones is metabolic regulation. And I think it's very appropriate to the topic today because I think here's where technology uh, could help us a bit. And I'm going to use the term metabolic regulation as a sort of a, a, a general term. I'll talk a little bit more about the specifics, but right now we're really talking about human biology. And the next slide, I always use um, the car analogy. So if you're um, if you're an overweight, sedentary, pre-diabetic or diabetic person, you're like the Volkswagen bug. Your engine doesn't work very well. And you can put rocket fuel in it and it still chugs along and that's the situation we're in in most people they have a vw bus metabolism and we're trying to fix that by putting good fuel into it uh if you look at the top the the other end of the spectrum is the athlete who consumes more sugar fat more of all the bad stuff than anybody recommends but they don't have any negative consequences because they're burning it. Um, a friend of mine looked at sugar intake in the Tour de France athletes, and it was, you know, 20 times the recommended sort of thing. But most people are going to be in the middle. Um, it'd be great if we could get everybody to be athletes, but if we could simply improve the engine a little bit from the VW to the, I don't know, Ford Fiesta or something, it would be a big, big deal. And yet, oftentimes, as we look at this whole weight management field, we forget about metabolism. And um, my point is going to be here at the end, if you have a Volkswagen metabolism, there's not much on the diet side you're going to do to make a difference in the long term, only in the short term. Next slide. So um, if you really drill down into metabolic regulation, and, and this is the topic I really wanted to talk about, because I think if we can figure out how to measure this more easily. And I love Dave's talk about all the technology going on, and it's it's really, really exciting. But here's an area we need to apply this to. One of the most important concepts, in my opinion, here is the idea of metabolic flexibility. And metabolic flexibility um, sort of is the ability of your physiology to adapt to the fuel situation uh, you're uh, incurring. And what people have looked at initially is metabolic flexibility in muscle and the liver. So basically, um, one of the ways I like to explain, it's a little bit of rounding of the corners. It's like having a thermostat. And, and in one system, the thermostat's really good. You, you crank it up, boom, the heat goes up right away. You crank it down, the heat goes down. In another one, it's a little sluggish. It gets there, but it takes a little while to heat up and go down. And that's what metabolic inflexibility is. When you're in a situation where you should use fat in a fasting situation away from meals, if you're metabolically inflexible, 
takes a little bit longer to switch over to fat metabolism. Similarly, when you get um, uh, food coming in, it takes a little bit longer to switch over. So it's sort of a slowing of these kinds of, of uh, uh, adaptations. And we know muscle and liver is involved, but I think what we're learning is there's maybe more involved. Next slide. So if you look over a whole day, you can see if you're sleeping, uh, your physiology should be running on, on uh, fatty acid oxidation, basically. Once you get up and eat a meal, you should switch over to glucose oxidation. If you're sitting, again, more toward fat burning. If you're exercising, more toward uh, glucose burning. And so during a day, you're constantly going through these situations of switching fuel. And the ability to switch quickly seems to be a metabolic advantage. And that's what you see particularly in the athletes. Next slide. What we know about metabolic flexibility, the major thing we know that predicts metabolic flexibility is physical activity. Here's uh, work from one of my former colleagues, Audrey Bergignon at Colorado. She did, um, she worked with NASA on a lot of the bed rest studies where they would have people to volunteer to be in bed for three or four months. It sounds good, but I think it was tough in the long run. And she found that um, simply one day of bed rest uh, makes a huge difference in metabolic flexibility. But she did another study in looking at uh, variation uh, due to sort of activity and physical activity. And she has followed this up and consistently found that exercise is the best predictor of metabolic flexibility, of change in metabolic flexibility. Now, I think diet plays some role. I think we're going to find that other things, I've always thought maybe sleep could play a role here. But from what we know right now, the best predictor of a flexible metabolism is physical activity. And that's why in the whole energy balance equation, a lot of people look at exercise saying it doesn't burn that many calories, but it also has this huge effect on metabolic regulation. And to me, that's one of the most important ways um, that physical activity plays a role. Next slide. So here's some of the work that's going on. Uh, there's some great work by Ben van Omen in the Netherlands, actually now saying uh, rather than metabolic flexibility, let's talk about phenotypic uh, flexibility. And the concept is each organ system has a metabolic flexibility. It's sort of like each organ system has an energy expenditure. If you measure it on the whole body, you get an accumulation of that. And it may be that phenotypic flexibility is the most important concept, and it's really contributed to by many, many different organ systems. So here's the rub. I can measure metabolic flexibility, but it's very difficult to do. I have to bring you into the lab. Ideally, I put you in a whole room calorimeter. I feed you a meal. I have to look at RQ following the meal. So it's not the kind of thing that is really useful in real life. I think one of the big leaps forward here could be, number one, better understanding phenotypic flexibility, but better ways to measure it. Next slide. So here's kind of an old slide from John Meir that some of you will recognize. And the idea here, he felt like there was a physical activity threshold for optimum weight. So if you're above that threshold, as energy intake goes up, energy expenditure goes up, body weight stable, this is sort of the good regulation zone. Alternatively, in the unregulated zone, the more sedentary you are, the more likely you are to overeat. This is a theoretical uh, version based on some data he collected with, uh, I think, Pakistani workers. But this model has really intrigued people for quite some time, that there may be this physical activity threshold. So once you're above it, it's sort of like your, your energy balance system is working with you. Below it, it's against you. Next slide. What I think is, let's keep going, let's, rather than an exercise thing, I think this is sort of a metabolic tipping point. And I think exercise is one of the primary contributors there. So if your metabolism is above this theoretical zone, 
you're actually working to avoid weight gain. Doesn't mean you, you will avoid it, but it means you have an advantage in doing it. Below that medical meta, uh, sorry, metabolic tipping point is the VW bug metabolism, where unfortunately most people, at least in this country and more and more around the world, are. So what we're trying to do is to take those people with below the metabolic tipping point and fix things with diet. So if you look at weight loss, uh, one of the things that we know is every diet that's been developed out there can produce weight loss, and almost none of them produce weight loss maintenance. Physical activity becomes the major correlate of successful weight loss. So with diet alone, the data suggests you can improve metabolic flexibility a little bit, but not that much. So you have people lose weight, they still have the crappy metabolism, which sets them up to regain it. And what I think we have to understand is you have to get the weight off, but you also have to fix the metabolism. So in my mind, where we can really use some technology is as the science better demonstrates what an optimum metabolism is for weight regulation and avoiding chronic disease, we really need um, good ways to measure that. So I think it may be that it's necessary to go below this metabolic tipping point before obesity and other chronic disease develop. So uh, if you stay above that, the chances developing these are low. If you're below it, it's high. This is not the only factor. It obviously depends on food intake, physical activity, the environment. But I think this whole concept of metabolic regulation is going to be critically, critically important for the future and for our future understanding of obesity and obesity-related diseases. So last slide, my three takeaways are energy balance is the right framework to understand obesity and body weight regulation, but it's not being widely used in the public health community too much focus on food. So people dismiss energy balance. Well, it can't be that simple. It's all about food. We really have to understand that energy balance doesn't give the answer. It's the framework for understanding the question. There's a clear underappreciation of the role of metabolic function or dysfunction in understanding and addressing obesity. In our programs now, we tell people right up front, your, your, your metabolism is not working right. The only way you're going to keep weight off the long term is to fix your metabolism. The way we know to do that right now is physical activity, but I think we will find that there's some other factors that contribute. And there's a huge need for better and easier ways to assess metabolic or phenotypic flexibility. Thanks. So Jim certainly kept the time. Um, we have time for several questions, actually. Amy. Yeah, I just, uh, Jim, this is Amy Subar. Hi. Uh, Hi, Amy. Hi. Um, it's really interesting. I really appreciate the, you know, the metabolic function thing. That was really um, interesting. But in terms of, like, public health recommendations, how, I mean, I know you feel like there's too much focus on food, but there is also a focus on improving physical activity and the, at least in the public health recommendations. So, how would some of this um, help inform the public health recommendations? Yeah, uh, I mean, again, no, it's a great, it's a great question. And, and, and I think what we've got to realize is both food and physical activity are the mm -hmm. right message. And there are some people giving that message. So I oversimplify when I say the physical activity community is focused on food. But if you look at the media and the messages given to the public, you see things like food's important, physical activity is great, but it's not really involved in weight management. I think it's beginning to understand how the two go together, that you're not going to fix a, a, a obese person with diet alone. You're not going to fix them with physical activity alone as well. It's as simple right. as you got to do both. And, you know, one of the depressing things for me is to think about how in the world are we going to increase physical activity in the population, given that the environment is going to make it easier not to move. Right. How are we possibly going to turn that around? Right. Yeah. Point well taken. Mm -hmm. Joanna? Um Jim, thank you for a lovely uh, talk. This is Johanna Dwyer calling. Uh, Hi, talking. Johanna. Um, I was a, a student of uh, John Mayer. Right. And 
many of us were very much taken by the theory, uh, which he elaborated further and talked about mesomorphic and different body types and that the endomorphs were different than the ectomorphs. They supposedly were the best regulators. The problem with that work is it's never been replicated. Absolutely. It needs to be. Uh, Judy Stern tried to do it in, in, in mice because there was a mouse experiment that my Aaron Van um, uh, Vitale did uh, together. But I think it's important to re replicate that because it's, it's really a fundamental um, insight if it, if it can be rep replicated. It certainly makes sense to me, but I'd like to see it done again. I'll just add, um, Jim, uh, hi Jim, this is Robin Schuch. Hey Robin. Um, he, 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 he left out my study that I believe he was a co-author on a few years ago. <laughs> I, I had a time challenge, come on. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, we, we use cross-sectional data in um, 400 young adults with objectively measured physical activity, and we recreated Meyer's curve using the cross-sectional data. And I've done a pilot study where we've tried to um, induce it in a lab setting, and we're currently trying to get NIH funding to scale that up. So Great. we're trying to do it. I I'll just also add there was, I believe it was last year, there was a systematic review by uh, John Blundell's group that uh, aggregated a bunch of studies and they saw the same relationship. So there's starting to be some of that work, work coming back. Robin, thanks for pointing that out. And I was a co-author on that study and it's a great study. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, Joanna, your point is still taken. What we're doing is nibbling around the corners and the data we have are consistent with this. But I think we need that, and, and Robin, I hope you get some funding for this, because I think we need that prospective study that can recreate this. To me, it makes so much sense. I think it fits, if you guys are familiar with Herman Ponser's constrained energy expenditure, this is so consistent with my ear. I've tried to explain to him why that's the case, but I'm not sure I've gotten through. But everything we have is consistent. I just don't think we have the definitive, oh, we've shown for sure this thing works. But I believe it does, and I believe it's one of the best models that we could um, promote out there. Just, just one follow-up on that. I think if, if people are testing it, it would be useful to look at um, better body composition measures than the uh, ectomorph, endomorph, mesomorph uh, stuff that was available in the 30s, which sort of schmicks of, you know, heads oh, I, or something. I agree like totally. That. I think accurate I body think composition is critical. He, he was very uh, intuitive. I know he's a brilliant yep. theoretician. May I? Yeah. Hi, Jim. This is Naomi Fukugawa. So hi, how Naomi. would you, hi, um, sorry you're not here, um, but how would you reconcile the pharmacologic approaches to altering the tipping point and reconcile that with respect to the set point theory for weight regulation? I'm not and sure I totally regulation. understand. Set point, well, but, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was just, I mean, those are two, you know, um, we're talking about food and activity, but a significant number of interventions that people consider are related to external pharmacologic and or bioactive compounds that are thought yep. to shift that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a great that's a great question. And in fact, if you look at the energy balance equation, you have so many different um, targets for potential pharmacological treatment other than food intake. You have food intake, you have on the physical activity side, people have been looking at can drugs mimic physical activity? And then in the metabolic regulation, can drugs increase metabolic flexibility? Can drugs increase the, the uh, usage of fat versus fat free during weight loss? So uh, again, I, I'm not hopeful that drugs are gonna solve the problem, but I think targeting drugs at places other than food intake provides some opportunities as well. I don't like the set point theory because I was taught in graduate school, any good theory has to be disproven and you can't disprove the set point. If body weight comes back, you say, ah, set point. If it changes, you say the set point changed. So I'm not a, very much a fan of the set point, but I do think there are multiple targets other than food intake for 
pharmacological intervention. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, Jim, this is Josh Anthony. How are you doing? Hey, Josh. Hey, uh, you said something kind of at the end of your talk very briefly, but I, I found it very depressing. Um, <laughs> You kind of pass by that this idea that with the sort of the metabol, you know, with with respect to this metabolic tipping point, that you really may have to act before somebody is overweight or obese. And so, for the seventy percent of us that fall into that category, what would you know? What do you recommend? Yeah. And I know that's a very complex question, but like, how does yeah, it? It's, how does it's the, actually. How does it, I think a lot about that, and I think you're right. Because I still think, even though we, we talk about prevention uh, being more feasible than treatment, and I believe that, but mm -hmm. you know, if if Joanna would say, "Well, prove it," there's no data, and that's exactly right. We haven't been any better at prevention than treatment, but I do believe that in the long run, preventing metabolism from start sort of being broken is going to be better than trying to fix it once it's broken, because we know with obesity. You can lose weight, but it seems like you're always paying a metabolic penalty there. You can lose weight, but you're always fighting both metabolism and the environment that sort of push you to regain. So I think, unfortunately, I think you're right. I think it's much harder to fix this than it is to prevent it going wrong in the first place.